All right, so this mini lecture series is part of a larger uh, lecture series called Error is Obvious. And what we're doing is we're looking at behavioral economics and we're seeing that behavioral economics has shown us that we're humans, we're not econs, right? We're not like Mr. Spock. We're instead, we're more kind of normal humans with mistakes and kind of weird quirks to us, all of this kind of stuff. But market economists have retorted back that the market process and not individuals carry the cognitive burden. We wanna look at how the market works given the mess of what we are. Another reply to behavioral economics has been to question its very approach to rationality. To state that we fall short of neoclassical hyper-rationality is somewhat obvious, and that's what behavioral economics is aiming to do. But to say that we fall short of neoclassical economic rationality is not necessarily the same as saying that we fall short, right? Maybe we want to judge ourselves against a different standard. It does seem kind of weird that behavioral economics does all that it can to, to attack the neoclassical idea of rationality, and yet that is its normative judgment of what the right behavior is. Nonetheless, behavioral economics has this mess of what we are, and there's lots of debate to be had here. But this mess of what we are does not always have to be something that we have to counter against to say that, oh, well, maybe markets work. It doesn't have to always be something that we have to overcome. Sometimes that mess actually helps us function more smoothly in markets or not. So what we're gonna do today in this lecture series is start to end our discussion by looking at what are at times the positive elements of our mess, of our humanness, the positive elements that help us solve the problems that we otherwise would not be able to. So I wanna start you off with an encounter that I recently had when I went down to an academic conference. I was sitting by an airport gate, uh, waiting for my flight to take off, and this other guy was next to me and we were kind of all crammed into a pretty small spot and he was sitting there charging his phone. I was sitting there charging my phone uh, and you know, we're just there and our flight's about to board in the next 25, 30 minutes. And there's a Wendy's just like right across the way. And the guy kind of turns to me and he's like, hey, you think I got enough time to get through that line at Wendy's? And I was like, oh, probably. Uh, you know, I, I think you would. He goes, would you mind watching my phone uh, while I go wait in that line, All right? Well, what this person was really saying to me is that if I would like to steal his phone, this is the time to do it, right? This, this is when I should do it. That seems really weird that he would, you know, just ask me, a perfect stranger, just because I happen to be standing there, right? And yet, this is the kind of behavior that often works out well for us. I'm not gonna steal his phone there. And we've seen other people do this where they ask somebody to hold their bag or things like this, right? This kind of behavior allows us to do things we otherwise wouldn't. We don't realize how much this kind of trust we have in society and how much it helps because it's omnipresent, because it's everywhere, right? So I have a relative who grew up in Brazil and these kind of things are not taken for granted because they don't happen anywhere nearly as frequently. In his TED Talk on the value of trust, Dan Arelli tells a story like this, and also a story about buying a fancy pen in South America. He was in a store and he went and he picked out the pen. And then the person selling him the pen gave him a piece of paper, and he had to go to another person at another part of the store. He goes to this other person and gives him the piece of paper and pays him. This person then hands back the piece of paper and sends him to a third part of the store with a third person. The third person then gives him the pen. Well, why did all of this happen? As Arelli recounts the story, she says, well, the store doesn't want anyone to have access to the money and the pen at the same time. There's a tremendous amount of checks and balances here to this system, right? To do something that we, in a country where there is this element of trust here, something we find very simple there's a huge cost to society here. Perhaps the ideas of trust, cooperation, and even fairness are more important than we often recognize in economics. 
And that is what we're going to talk about in this mini lecture series. All right, guys, so that is our introduction to this Errors Obvious mini lecture series on trust, cooperation, and fairness. Click on the video right over here to see our coverage of trust.